All right, I think we're gonna just go ahead and start. So welcome to our first MTNA lunch break series. Uh, I really wish that we can all be in person, but through Zoom is quite nice too. Um, so we're gonna introduce Dr. Karen Taylor, um, and we'll come up with a, we came up with a set of questions that we'll ask her, but you guys can feel free to just chime in, and ask any questions that you would like, um, that you're curious about, and it's more of like a conversation than an interview. All right, and I'll hand it over to Nietzsche. Well, um, I, I feel like everyone knows who Dr. Karen Taylor is. Um, she is the founder of IU Young Pianist Program since 1988 and the IU Piano Academy around the same time. And she has so much wisdom and experience in the pedagogical field. And we are so grateful to have her here to share her experiences and give us some advice. So let's just go ahead and get started. Let me say that I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to see some old friends and some new friends. <laughs> Um, and uh, if I talk too much and you want to, and you want to ask a question, signal to me and hopefully I'll see you or Nisha or Rachel will see you and we'll get your questions in. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Taylor, would you tell us about your musical background and your training? Um... Okay. Um, it may, it may or may not surprise you to know that, uh, Unlike many young students of piano who really thrive, I, I didn't thrive, I barely survived. Um, I had probably the world's worst teacher, at least the way I look at it. <laughs> I was one of four children and of, of public school teacher parents uh, who didn't know anything about music, although back a few generations in my family there was some music. And so they decided, they were very, very busy, of course, and they decided that uh, we all should have piano. You know, in those days, you had piano to become a well-rounded person, which is something um, lots of kids did, many more than today. So they sent me to a piano teacher who happened to be the lady who lived across the back fence, um, who probably had no formal piano training. She she played organ in the local church and she she was absolutely nuts uh she would sit in a rocking chair all the way through the lessons like this and what she did was write in all the fingerings and write in all the counts one and two and when i finished playing something she said all right now another one <laughs> and that's the training i got for eight years and even a little bit more um but because I didn't ever go to concerts, I was 14 before we got a, a record player in my house. I never went to concerts. Um, I never heard a good pianist. I didn't know what I was missing, really, until I got to high school. And I had a wonderful choral teacher in high school who put me to accompanying and put me to uh, conducting madrigals and rehearsing and all sorts of things like that. Um, and I, the reason I got out of that terrible situation is really funny. I'm, I'm from Ohio and we have something in Ohio which is very much like ISSMA, okay? In other words, it's the public school competition that you do through your local school, only it was OSSMA or something. And I had done it for a bunch of years and always done fine. And I went to this competition and I happened to get a real judge who knew what he was doing. And I got the equivalent of a D for my performance of the Pathétique. But he said to me in the comments, he said, you are very talented. You really need to find yourself a good teacher and get out of the situation you're in. Um, nobody says those things anymore. It's considered impolite, you know, you don't, you don't knock any other teacher. But if he hadn't said that to me, I might, probably would have gone into the sciences or into creative writing, which I loved a lot. Um, but I went home and I cried for two days. And then I said to my parents, get me a good teacher or I'm quitting piano. 
And I had three sisters who'd already quit piano. They all started and they all couldn't stand this horrible teacher. But I loved music so much. I just didn't pay any attention to her and did what I wanted and cop copied uh, pieces off the radio and the, um, eventually the TV, you know. Uh, I played by ear and all that sort of thing. So it blessed his heart. This choral conductor said, you need, you need to take her down to the Cleveland Institute of Music. We were about 12 miles from the Cleveland Institute all those years. I missed out on that. However, I got a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And you asked your questions, included a question later about who were the people most influential on my uh, career in music. And she was the first of three that I would mention. Her name was Elizabeth Pastor. She was um, absolutely fantastic. Um, it, I think the thing that really made her stand out so much is that she saw where I was and she came to me where I was and she did not, um, she was always encouraging. Even when I wasn't playing very well, <laughs> she was always encouraging and she always had a way of lifting me up and asking for just a little more, just a little more. Um, and she wasn't, um, oh, you're wonderful, great, it's lovely, whatever. She had, you know, she was fairly honest and um, extremely musical and she knew every musician who came to Cleveland. She took me to, to hear Fikushini. She took me to Oberlin to hear George Zell play with the Cleveland Orchestra and also Pierre Monteur and, and other wonderful composers. I started hearing real concerts. I went to hear Arthur Rubenstein at the Cleveland Auditorium and sat way up in the crow's nest, which is all we could afford, but he was, he was wonderful. If you, if you ever got to see him, you know that the minute he walked out on stage, it was like, I love you all and I'm so happy to be here. He has the, had this sort of aura about him of um, reaching out and communicating with his audience from, from the get-go. Um, and so when it was time for me to start looking at colleges, my wonderful teacher, Lisa Pastor, said, Karen, I don't know if you're going to be able to make it into a music major. Maybe you should consider music education. And that was really wise advice, but I didn't have to choose yet. So I, st I, I auditioned, auditioned at Eastman and auditioned at Oberlin and auditioned at Baldwin Wallace and Dipa. Got into all of them. Actually, I got in as a, as a piano major. Unfortunately for me, I didn't get a big enough scholarship at Eastman or Oberlin to go there. Um, half wasn't enough with four kids and another one getting ready for college one year later. So I went to DePa, which offered me a full scholarship. If you know DePa, it's just a, about 55 miles from here. Um, it's a good little school. Actually, it's a great, it was a great liberal arts school. It used to be called the MIT of the Midwest. It turned out more um, professors and more leaders in business than practically any college around. Uh, it was not the greatest school of music, but um, it had something which even IU does not now have, which is that they would send you anywhere on an independent study abroad that you wanted to go provided you spoke the language. That, that was the only criterion. So I, I said, I'll go to Paris. <laughs> and, I, and I did. And I, and I went there actually at the beginning of a summer and stayed all the way through January. Wrote them and said, can I please stay longer? Because I actually was with my second important teacher. Um, but they said, if, if you stay longer, you have to declare yourself as a French major. I didn't want to do that. So I came home and finished at Dupa and took a job um, in the placement office at Case Western Reserve. Um, and that was another very lucky thing because in the interim, I've had to write hundreds of recommendation letters. And let me tell you, I know how to write one after copying, I had to type out handwritten recommendation letters from morning till night. Did that for a whole year 
Shall I stop and let you ask another question? No, I think it's great. You can, you're, uh, how about, I'm just curious, just because you told us so much about your background um, with your upbringing and your uh, teachers that impacted you. Um, how has that shaped you as a teacher? And do you, what is your teaching philosophy, if you have one? And I guess, what could you give us as an advice for young teachers like us? All that, huh? <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, well, as far as my early training, what that taught me is how not to teach. <laughs> I learned a whole lot about how not to teach <laughs> from my first teacher. And I learned a whole lot about how to teach from Elizabeth Pastor. Most of all, from her, I would say, she, she taught me all kinds of things about piano playing, about technique, about interpretation, and so forth. But what I learned most, I think, was, let, let me quote you another uh, person you may have heard of, who was a, not a close friend, but a friend of mine, Helga Winold, who used to teach cello here, taught at the pre-college for many, many years. She said, people say to me, ah, you teach cello. And I say to them, no, I don't teach cello. I teach students. And that's one of the things that I think is so, so important in teaching is that you don't just think of yourself as someone who gives all kinds of information and instruction and corrections and what have you to your student, but that you actually you actually relate to the student, you figure out what's on their mind, how their mind works, what their big interests are if it's not piano yet. You find out uh, how to touch them and how to reach them way, way inside. And if you do that, the rest will follow very often to the limits of their abilities. And of course you cannot, um, Can't squeeze blood from a turnip, as they would say about four generations ago. If somebody doesn't have any talent at all, you can you can inculcate them with a great love of music, and you can take them as far as their abilities will allow. But you're not going to take them to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> On the other hand, I think many many times we don't know at the pre-college level, particularly, what a student has and what a student is going to become. It's, it's often a mystery and we have to sort of, we have to dig in, we have to figure that out. Um, a lot of it by talking to them about things that may not necessarily be just musical, okay? Things um, that they're interested in, okay? Um, and also when you do teach them a piece or even just an exercise to make it interesting and exciting, somehow to to hook them i mean we we have to do that when they're young because so many of them really it's a rare child who knows from the age of eight or nine that they're, they want to be a pianist you know i've taught a few jonathan biss for instance and uh, a couple others um i knew and they knew that he was going to become a pianist but for most it's it's a long haul and the most important thing is that they catch fire. They have to catch fire somehow. And that's our job as much as anything else. A lot of other things can help. Going to concerts can help. Going to camps can help so much. Um, having friends who play and who are serious about practicing can help a great deal. Um, having performance opportunities can help. Um, so many children don't know how, how wonderful it is to play the piano until they get out in front of people and get, are gratified with applause and, and, you know, everything that comes back to them from friends and parents and other teachers, okay, compliments and so forth, that, that they're validated in a sense for what they do. Um, and then they want, they want that more and more and they're willing to work for that. Um, where did I, where did, what did I skip? 
Oh, maybe I should tell you about my French teacher. Um, and then my last important teacher uh, quickly because I'm, I feel like I'm talking a lot and we have many questions to go. <laughs> um, my French teacher's name was Yvonne Lefebure and she was a student of Alfred Cortot. You probably haven't heard of her, but I imagine you've heard of Alfred Cortot. She was also a student of Marguerite Long who made so many um, wonderful recordings of Ravel and who wrote three books, one on Debussy, one on Foray and one on Ravel. Um, and uh, Madame Lefebvre was a real firebrand, a real, real dynamo. She, she just, um, when she played as when she taught, she was just so, so enthusiastic, so excited about it. And she was the first teacher I had who was really an, an artist performer. And sometimes when I would listen to her play, not only would I want to play like her, but I, she almost would make me cry, you know? <laughs> it's very funny how that happens when you're at a certain age, somewhere between high school and graduate school, you know, you hear someone and it's just mind blowing. I mean, it, it goes right to your soul. I remember once my friend Christopher Harding telling me that when he was studying with Mr. Pressler, he came in with a Chopin Mazurka one time and uh, he said it left a lot to be desired. And Mr. Pressler just pushed him away and sat down and played a Chopin Mazurka. And, and Christopher said to me, by the time he was finished, tears were rolling down my face. I was so moved and I, and, and I was so aware of the gap between where I was and where Chopin Mazurka performances could be, you know, that, that's kind of the thing that would happen with her. Uh, another wonderful lucky thing that happened with her is that although I was taking private lessons with her, she said, why don't you come and sit in on my conservatoire courses? Everything is class in the conservatory in those days, and maybe still today. So she had 20 students or 16 students, something like that. And they met twice a week for four or four and a half hours straight. And we had about a, about a five minute break in the middle. Everybody brought everybody's music. Everybody got everybody's lesson. And I learned so much about so many pieces. This is all, of course, if you look at it from the other side, this is good for the teacher because the teacher doesn't have to say again and again the same basic things. The teacher can kind of uh, assume that the students, after a while, if they've been in the class, they know some of the basic things and they can, she can get into, or he can get into the more esoteric or the more advanced things or the more personal things for that matter. Um, so I, I adored Yvonne Lefebvre. She was a hoot. She was a, she was a very funny lady. When I first came to uh, see her for the first time, um, she was in her studio and she was at the piano. She was practicing a little bit and there was a kind of sofa there by the side. And I walked in, I introduced myself and I said, uh, I'm so pleased to meet you and all. And I went to sit down on the sofa and she said, no! And I jumped up and down, <laughs> scared me to death. She said, I sleep on that sofa at night because I don't get to start practicing until nine o'clock and I don't finish till one or two in the morning. So don't, don't sit on my bed. Sit on this chair over here. Um, that's just a funny little anecdote. She, she wasn't that crazy all the time, but that scared me to death for someone who'd never met her before. Um, <clears throat> I got to hear her perform very often, Ravel Concerto. Um, some foray. Uh, she was a wonderful Bach performer. She's on the YouTube if you ever want to hear some of her things. Not everything that's on there is really great playing, but um, some of her uh, master classes are on there, and that's really interesting. Say a real quick word about my final um, teacher who was a wonderful influence on me, and his name was Walter Robert. He taught here at IU. Um, he was an amazing man. He was a, not only a fine performer and especially a fine uh, accompanist, but he was a great scholar. He wrote, uh, he translated Descartes from the Latin to English. He, uh, before he ever got into uh, the Wiener Hochschule where he went to school, uh, he went to classical high school in Germany 
and he had eight years of Greek and nine years of Latin before he ever got to college. So he knew so much. And, uh, and he, he liked to write articles. And he was, he, for me, he was, maybe he wasn't the most impressive of my teachers that I loved. I love all three of them. But he was the true mentor. And I, I, um, after I finished my doctorate, he went on teaching me absolutely gratis for no money for probably about six or eight years. Um, whenever I had something ready, whenever I had a program I wanted to play. Um, and uh, he, he could tell one so much about, you know, the background, about composers, about the time, about the genesis of works, what, what, um, what was going on in the world that influenced the composer. Um, and I don't have time to tell you the anecdotes, but if you catch me sometime, I'll be happy to tell you a few of them. Um, I'll tell you one funny thing. He had a great sense of humor and very self-deprecating. And one time there was a student who saw him, I was walking with him down the hall in MU, and a student was coming up from the MA and saw him and, and ran and said, oh, Dr. Robert, Dr. Robert. And, and as soon as he got up to him, he turned around and said, do I play that badly? He didn't have a doctorate. <laughs> uh, anyway, so do you want to ask me another question? Uh, before I ask my questions, um, does anyone want to ask any questions? Go to it. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is maybe more like on the technical side rather than your background, Dr. Taylor. I was wondering when you get a new student who hasn't taken any piano before, how do you set them up like physically? And then what, um, what things do you really focus on in those first few months of lessons? Um, well, I, the first thing I try to do is to see how that, I try to try to discover how that student takes direction, whether I can be blunt, whether I can be, you know, really truthful or whether I have to tippy toe around um, and uh, say things in, in a very encouraging and positive way and not say everything that I, that I think. Um, because I, I think it's very easy um, to, to want so much to fix everything that you just kind of overload the student at the very beginning. And they, instead of being grateful for all that you're telling them, they begin to feel very inadequate and that we don't want that because once that happens then they start to turn you off very often you know they don't they don't want to hear what you have to say um so i sometimes like to uh, to give it depends on the age it's it's highly variable if you're talking about a five-year-old if you're talking about a 15 year old but I, I will often give pieces that I think are a little easier than that student can, can do once they are fully hooked and once they are um, practicing correctly and all those things. Um, and, and I think that that gives the student courage. They, they may not really know what you're going to be doing with them. They may not know what you think of them regardless of what you say some some teachers don't tell the truth ever and have told them all their some you get students who had teachers who told them their whole life that they were wonderful that they were great and suddenly the first class that they have with you where they hear other students they realize that they are pretty awful you know um i another thing i like to do is i don't i don't give a lot of technique but i start technique um almost immediately a little bit, okay? And it may be just um, our little Cherny Hannon book that has the, e the easy Hannons in there because that gives me a chance to work on hand position and it gives me a chance to work on posture and all those things. The more difficult the music, the less attention the student has for those sorts of things. Um, so, so I want the student to have a lot of attention I, I may do some scales too. And I start sight reading because in my experience, um, being a poor sight reader is one of the greatest handicaps to a student who has talent. 
being able to, to make it, okay? Um, if the student is, is, is up around ninth or 10th grade and it's taking them six or eight months to learn a short piece, they're not gonna make it probably, you know? So my, my goal in sight reading is that if I've had a student for at least four or five years or longer, that by the time they get out of high school, that they can sit down and read a Beethoven sonata movement and they can read it well, you know? Um, I, I want them at that level because if you are a good reader, then it takes you maybe a tenth, a fiftieth of the time to really get to the point where you can get through the piece even, okay? Um, if you're a good reader, you have so much more attention for the dynamics, for the articulation, for the pedal, for the um, rhythm, so forth and so on. Um, if you're a good reader, you read a, uh, you cover a lot more ground in a given term, okay? Maybe not two pieces, but six pieces or seven, whatever. And when you do that, what happens is that you are getting exposure to many styles and characters of music and many um, keys. And, and all of that is making you a better reader of what's coming next, okay? If you have to play a piece in, in G flat major and all you've played are pieces in C and G and F, and I have had many students that come to me like that, it's, it's really hard. It's so hard, you know? Um, so I, you know, that's something that I do very gradually is to branch out and give pieces in different keys. And I tell my students I'm allergic to C major. I don't give pieces in C major, but, but you can have one in G. Or sometimes I'll tell them you can have one C major piece per semester, not more. <laughs> this, is, this is not, um, the five-year-old who's taking piano for the first six months, but um, somewhat in between, you know, the student who is anywhere from um, medium beginner to um, early intermediate, okay? Um, I know I'm forgetting so many things. I actually have a follow-up question to Liz's question. Um, I sometimes find myself uh, when working with a student who's very talented musically, that their sight reading um, isn't as strong and they tend to be more of a listener and a more visual and they kind of want to avoid reading because they just want to get ahead and play. Um, right. Do you have any tips? Um, yeah. This, to is gonna, um, that? this is only going to be good for the young pianist teachers who are listening in after they get out of this situation where they only have one hour but what I, what I actually do is I have them I have them read in the lesson so they can't avoid it I, I may I may take uh, if, if I put something up there and I see they're stumbling all over the place then I'll I'll back down and I'll take something easier what I um, have done for many when I started I just had them read and that made them really nervous of course um, what I do in the now and I have done for a number of years um, is I give them a, a little portion of a piece. It may be four lines, it may be a page. And I ask them some questions about it, like what key is it in? What is the time signature? How would you count this? Do you see any markings that you don't understand? So forth. I don't have them play it for me. And then I go away. I go actually out of the room. And the reason I do that is because many children d don't want you to hear all their messy stuff while they're fumbling around on all their mistakes and stuff. That, that's embarrassing to them. So I, I let them, but I'm very careful not to give them more than a maximum five minutes, somewhere between three and five, depending on the, the difficulty of the piece. And then I come back and listen to it. And then we talk about how they could have practiced it differently to get further along, okay? So I'm, I'm trying that way to kind of um, get, get a, a, a lot of birds with one stone. <laughs> Sorry for the un-PC expression, but 
I'm working on practice habits. I'm working on knowledge of uh, terms and rhythm. I'm, I am working on reading. Um, and I have a lot of suggestions that I give for reading. I don't have time probably to do to give you too, too much on that if we want to get to the other questions. But just a couple of things I would say is um, I, would, I would tell them uh, to take small bites and chew them really well rather than just run through the piece playing from beginning to end to take uh, maybe just to look at the piece before they start, okay? And then take one phrase. And if that's too much, take one measure and add and add, then take two phrases and so forth. Um, and if the piece isn't too hard or too long, they can do that in, in five minutes and they're gonna be okay. I also sometimes tell them to, to play the scale of the piece and the arpeggio of the piece before they read it, okay? To get, this, to get the pitch inventory in their mind before they start. Also for sight reading, it's, I think it's really important um, to read from the bottom up, okay? Because we, we tend to be melody oriented and we tend to hear what's on top much better than we hear the middle voices and the harmony. So if you try, if you, if you really practice reading from the bottom up, okay? It can be very helpful. Um, there, are, there are lots of other things you can do. You need to really be reading ahead of where you're playing um, to be a good reader. Uh, and uh, so I can practice those things with them in the lesson by just taking a, a ruler or a piece of paper and moving the paper ahead of where they're playing, okay? That's really not the five minute sight reading piece. That's a different kind of sight reading. If I have a student who really needs lots and lots of help with sight reading. Other questions? Uh, if there's no other questions, I think we all really want to know, um, other than it being a pedagogue, um, you also founded the YP and the PA program, and you must have faced a lot of difficulties along the way. Um, could you tell us how you built it to where it is now and the challenges you faced? Great, glad to. Um, so, so when I started uh, Piano Academy and Young Pianists, there really wasn't any program at IU except something called music clinics. And if you were already very advanced, you could go and take lessons with one of the regular faculty, okay? So I, my first challenge was where do I get all the students? Because there were at that time, even many more than there are today, independent teachers out there who were well-established and who had lots of students. So what to do? Now, it, it happens that I myself was teaching independently before I had the Young Pianists and the Piano Academy. I was, I was uh, teaching out of state. I commuted back and forth to a community college in Illinois and taught, <laughs> I taught piano, I taught French diction, I taught opera workshop, I taught the complete theory series, you know, for two years, um, plus uh, sight singing and ear training and all that, not just the, uh, so anyway, everything but the kitchen sink. Um, and I taught a lot. That's why it took me almost 10 years to get my doctorate here. So I was teaching and teaching and teaching. I don't advise doing that much teaching, by the way. It slows you down and you really need to more time for your performance than that. But uh, I was teaching also in uh, Terre Haute, uh, where I had a friend who asked me to come up and teach a few of her students after she left. And I had 24 students here at I in Bloomington. Um, and some of them were very good. So the first thing I did was I threw my whole private studio into the program. Um, that cost me quite a bit, but um, you see, with a starter batch like that, you really are at a great advantage because I, I don't know who it was. I think it was Leszczytski said uh, that uh, um, a comet attracts meteors. In other words, Good students attract good students. So if you have good students, they will bring in more good students. So, and I had some very good students who were private students of mine. Some of them actually went into music 
And so I put them all in and then I just made some advertisements and they said, give your child the gift of piano. And I took them around to Ballantyne and to the uh, Wells Library and here, there and everywhere and hung them up, hung them in on the kiosks around campus. And with all of that, I think we had about 40 or 45 students in young pianists, including the 24 of mine <laughs> in, in the first semester. But, you know, uh, I didn't have to hang those signs for very long, maybe two or three years, you know, and it, it started to grow because the students who were in, the parents who were in, told other parents. And uh, so, you know, there's nothing that will bring students in like good students and students who are happy, okay? Um, as for Piano Academy, boy, that was a tough one to start. We had, the first summer we had 23 students and a couple of them could barely find middle C. <laughs> it was pretty bad. <laughs> but we had, we had guest teachers, including, if you can believe this, Menachem Pressler, who agreed to come and give a master class. Bless his heart. I mean, he's, he was, has been for many years one of the great supporters of the Piano Academy. Only in the last two years when his health hasn't been very good has he not been able to come to give a class. But every year, faithfully, he, he would come and give a class. And so would uh, a number of the other IU teachers. And I had friends out, in, out and about from other schools um, whom I had known mainly as classmates when I was at IU, you know. And uh, I, I would ask them to come give master classes. Um, there was one question I really wanted to answer that's a little bit further down, if it's all right if I jump. Um, and that was the question of, of how to get started and how to get a job. How to, how, how to, you know, what to do once you finish that doctorate and you're sitting there with that piece of paper and it seems like everybody is applying for every job that comes available. There's 50 or 100 or 150 applicants um, and I have a few suggestions for you. Um, and I would love it if anybody out there also could give some suggestions. Um, my first suggestion actually goes back before you finish uh, your studies. From the time that you get into college, if not before, network, network, network. Okay. There are actually, uh, somebody said to me one time, there are two, two kinds of teachers the better mousetrap teacher and the networking teacher who, who can be really successful. The better mousetrap teacher is the one who, who has ideas and who has skills so far beyond the average that they will shine and they will become known. And those, those skills may be in the performance area or in the teaching area or both. Okay. And, but the networker is the one who who really stays in touch with everybody who's, whom they meet, whom they respect as a musician or pianist. Um, you would be amazed at how many people get jobs because some friend is teaching at that school already and says, hey, you know, there's going to be an opening at my, at my college or at my university. Um, I think you should apply for it. Okay. The other thing is um, a couple more, couple more suggestions. Don't wait until you're out, out of college to ask your teachers for recommendations. Ask for the recommendations right around the time you finish the course or right around the time you, you're finishing taking lessons with that teacher when you are very fresh in their mind and they, they know and like and respect you. And you will, number one, you will get a very much better recommendation. Number because they may not even remember you very well after 10 years or whatever and say, I'm sorry, I really don't feel um, that this is um, something I can do, blah, 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 blah. Thanks, but no thanks. The other thing is, believe it or not, they might die. It happened to me. 
that one of my teachers that I did not ask, and I have a minor in comparative literature, and one of my teachers that I did not ask um, suddenly passed away. And I was, I was, you know, very sorry, of course, first of all, that she was no longer with us, but also I was sorry that I had not done things when I should have, okay? Because it, there was no longer any chance. Any other questions? Um, I, would, I would say one more thing, okay? When you have friends out in other schools with jobs, even if there's no opening there, trade recitals. You go play at their school and have them come and give a master class to your students, okay? Get those things going, you know, as early as you can and as often as you can. Um, any questions? I actually have a question related to teaching. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Well, I'm in the hallway. Okay. Um, like throughout the years of your teaching, um, how has your teaching method changed or has it changed at all? And how, has, how have you adapted to the different situations and your different way of thinking as the years pass? Um, now, when, when I started, I wanted to tell students everything I knew that I thought they ought to know. Um, and I wanted to tell it to them all real soon, you know? Maybe not all in one lesson, but I, I sort of dumped this huge amount of knowledge and strategies and skills on them all at once. Um, and now I'm much more interested in getting to know my student and getting to know, uh, getting on their wavelength and finding out how they best learn. You know, there are, t there are students who learn best by challenge and competition. And there are others who just crumble under that. They, they need a warm and nurturing teacher, um, not one who lies to them really, but, uh, but one who, who establishes a very, very strong personal rapport. Um, I, another thing I've learned in the meantime, I guess, is that no teacher is right for all students. Uh, as much as you think you know a lot, as much as you think that you are a really good teacher, as much as you've gone to all the, I used to go to every MTNA national convention. I'm a little old now. I used to go to every IMTA state convention. I didn't always learn a lot, but I did, I did learn a fair amount and I could network. That was really valuable, you know, but um, I think I've lost my train of thought. I was, <laughs> sorry about that. I was going to tell you something more. Um, I think, I think uh, we have to find out what that, what I keep coming back to, you have to find out what makes that student tick. And you have to know when is the right time to give this or that, uh, to, to em emphasize this or that skill. With some students, I can tell right away that if I, that if I dumped a whole lot of scales on them and insisted on that from the very first, that uh, I'd lose them. On the other hand, I think now looking back at all the teaching that I've done, one of the things uh, that I think I didn't do enough of in, in the first years was establish really, really strong technical foundations, establish really strong skills, okay? I, I was really good on the interpretive side. I was really good on the, on the theory and the conceptual side and all of that. But uh, if a student didn't want to practice those scales and those arpeggios and didn't want to get them really fast or so, I kind of, I kind of let, them, let them get away with that. And I wasn't doing them any favor. Um, I, it's too easy to let that pass. It's just too easy. But then if you, you know, oh, the other thing I wanted to say to you is that um, uh, something that you should all keep in mind, I think, um, is uh, in, the, in the matter of skills and uh, conceptual knowledge, take, take nothing for granted when you have a new transfer student. Take nothing for granted. 
uh, because they may seem to know far more than they do. And they, and, and they may have big holes. On the other hand, in the matter of potential and musical talent, give them the benefit of the doubt. Say to yourself, this might be the student that I can turn around who's going to become a professional. You don't know at the sixth grade because they may not have caught fire yet, you know? And once they do, all of a sudden, they just fly. And you say, that student has so much more talent than I ever would have imagined when they came to me in grade four or whatever. Is anybody else have a question for me? I have a question related to that. Yes. Um, so I had a student who was, he was like 12 or 13, and he was one of those boys that really likes to play, really loves loud and fast music and Russian music, but of course does not have the skills to do that. Right. And then so, um, so he loves music, but he wouldn't like have the motivation or dedication to actually practice anything that was hard. And I wasn't sure like how to push him, when to push him and, um, uh -huh what are the things I could do for him to help him to keep that love alive? Um, even though he didn't I find like pieces of an easier level, which have that loud and powerful, you know, if, if the student is wanting to play Rachmaninoff, uh, a to tableau or prelude, something really loud and flashy, but, uh, they don't have the technique. There's, a uh, for instance, there's a couple of wonderful pieces in Heller, you know, that, that something like that makes a great deal of noise and isn't that hard. <laughs> and so I would look, I would look for pieces of that kind. Um, if it's if they don't have that much ability yet, I would come down to this. No, uh, there are there are pieces um, by Mendelssohn which have uh, wonderful excitement and power. Um, that's what comes to mind right away. That helps a lot. Thank you. Oh, I didn't know that Heller. I didn't know that Heller. Oh, it's oh, it's very, it's very show offy, and it's not that hard. <laughs> Are there any other questions from everyone? Anyone? Okay, I do have one more question. Sure. Um, you've talked about a lot of different ways you approach different students. Um, but was there a time where there was like a time of your life where you weren't sure that you wanted to continue this as a music educator or if, was there a challenge that kind of made you think is this the right way or if I should do this? I kind of always thought I would be a teacher but I didn't there was a point when I didn't know if I'd be a teacher of piano or music. Um, coming from a teaching family, I think it's in my genes. Um, but I, there was a, a crisis. I think we almost all go through a crisis at some point. And I went through a crisis around the, the third, uh, second or third year of undergraduate school. Um, and, and I kind of woke up and realized that I had never consciously made the decision to go into music or to become a pianist. That everybody had always said, well, of course you're going to do that. You're so talented. Ta -da -ta -da, you know? And uh, so I really, uh, it hit me very hard, actually. And I started practicing less and less. So till I was practicing less than an hour a day. And I, I was taking a course in ceramics at the time. And I threw all my passion and love and energy into that and, and practiced throwing pots for four hours a day. And not playing the piano. And I finally got over that when, when I realized that, that everything is as difficult as piano if you take it seriously and you go to the professional level 
And so if I went on with my ceramics, I'd probably come in to the same hard wall, you know? We, we, we just have to, we have to get over those things. And, and I, I just made a kind of conscious decision that I would study piano and if it was going to be performance, fine. I, with my early background, it wasn't going to be performance, but I acted as though it was, as long as I could, you know, through school or teaching. And, um, and I discovered that I had a flair for teaching when, when people would come and ask me and teach them a little bit. I, I started, my first student was in high school and I didn't teach him piano, but my choir director said, no, Jack wants to sing in the choir and he's tone deaf. Can you teach him? And he really, truly was tone deaf. I mean, he, you would play a note like this and he would, uh, like this, and he would sing a note like that. He, could, he couldn't come close. And uh, that, that was one of the biggest challenges of my life, to what to do with poor Jack. Um, and I actually did manage to, you know what I did? This is so funny. I don't know if anybody else does this kind of thing. Um, most, most people give up on tone deaf students without trying to teach them. But I, I was stubborn and I wanted to prove to my choir director that I could make a difference here. So I gave him a note and I had, I had him try to sing that note. And then I had him hold, uh, push his hand against his throat the way that you do when you are teaching somebody um, who, who has a, a lisp or something like that, um, okay? They can, they can find something with some types they, they need to either see in a mirror or they need to feel. And so I had him put, put his hand there and sing. And when he, when he got to the right note, I'd say higher or lower. When he got to the right note, I'd say, that's it. And then I'd play that for a while and then I'd have him until he learned just where it was in his voice. Okay, so he, he never became a great singer, but he managed to sing well enough not to get thrown out of the choir. So yeah. that, that led me to think that um, maybe I was a pretty good, pretty good teacher after all. And, uh, and I did a lot of coaching of friends in undergraduate school. And from the time I came here, I taught, I taught as an AI and I taught privately. Um, don't tell anybody because this doesn't exist anymore, but I think I had seven or eight AI ships. Um, they just kept giving them to me. <laughs> Back in those days, they didn't have a limit of three, you know, and it was easier to give me another one than to teach somebody else how to be an AI, but don't tell. <laughs> the person who was in charge of that was not, was not Dr. Cartledge. I don't think he would do that. <laughs> Somebody who does, doesn't teach anymore for the music school. <laughs> Anything else I can answer? Um, I have a question about online teaching. Um, so oh. I, <laughs> I, this might be just like, I hate online teaching and I can't wait to get back to in-person, but I was wondering if there's anything that you've discovered during the period of online teaching that you think works particularly well or any strategies you've uh, found that you really like to adapt? Ah, uh, you know, I, I, the sound is so bad that most of the time I'm just trying to figure out what the student is actually playing <laughs> because some of my students really have terrible, terrible equipment. Um, does anything work? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I teach a lot in the same way. I, I guess my biggest frustration, it, besides the sound, is that once they start to play and when I want to stop them for something, they can't hear me. And so they go on for pages and pages, you know? So often, I'll, I'll, if it's a young student, I'll have the parent, I'll ask the parent to stay there in the room during the lesson. And when the student is playing, if they can't hear me, I'll wave and the parent will see me. <laughs> and, then, and then they'll stop uh, the student. I don't, I don't have any really bright ideas. I mean, if so, some teachers of my acquaintance 
uh, will not teach online unless the student sends them a recording of, the, of what they're going to play before the lesson. Um, I don't do that, but I can certainly see the advantages of doing so. And I, and I may decide to at some, at some point. I actually have a question, sure. um, and I know we're kind of running out of time, but I was I was thinking about your comments about uh, when you were a young teacher not placing value on technical regimen, and I think I find myself in that place right now as well, where I'm more focused on lighting the fire in them than on giving them technique, because I find that those two things don't happen simultaneously. So I'm wondering if you have a strategy. They rarely happen simultaneously. I, I don't have a strategy, but I have some, I have some things to do for technique. Um, I mean, assuming that we don't have basic problems of hand position or something like that. Okay. Um, I, I think it's having good scales and arpeggios is a, is a start in the right direction because it, it allows you to gain some facility, okay? And it allows you uh, oh, many other things. There just are a, lot, are a lot of scales in real music. And that's one thing that I tell students, you know, there are a lot of arpeggios. I say, you don't want to learn your scale? What are you going to do when you play this? Which is nothing but scales practically. Um, so one of the things I do is I, I get together with the parent and, and devise an incentive thing, okay? If the student can, can play all their scales, this of, I mean, it comes in various uh, levels or, yeah, it comes in levels. So in the first level, if they can play their scales, all of them at whatever metronome marking I think they can manage, you know, um, then, then they get some kind of reward. And the only thing I don't allow is money, but they can ask mom to cook their favorite meal. They can ask for movie tickets. They can ask for a score. I encourage very much asking for music that they like. If they, if they are doing only classical and they would like to do a little rag or jazz or something or, or something like that, you know, to ask for that. Anyway, so they get, they get something or they get to have a sleepover with their friends. It depends on the age, what you, what, you know. But I, I do this up through junior high and <laughs> um, then after that, I start to use scales in a way that, in, that, that makes them, brings them closer to music, okay? So, so my next challenge is to play one hand forte and the other hand piano on all their scales, right? And after, after they can do that, and do that fast, I, I'll have them start and I'll say switch, and they have to change hands in the middle, and then switch. Uh, sometimes if that's too hard for them, I'll say ready, switch. So they have a little mental heads up, okay? And after they can do either hand, uh, strong and the other one very soft then I will have them uh, play one hand staccato and the other hand legato and and reverse and then switch <laughs> in the middle you know the switching becomes a fun game I can see that they're, that they're not disliking it anymore they laugh and they smile and they, they think it's funny when they trip up and and I don't give them enough time. And they're very proud when they can do it, you know. Um, and and I, I may do the same thing with uh, arpeggios a little, a little later. But I like, to, I like to have the scales really, really well done. If I have a student that seems like they may have promise, they may decide to go into music, um, then by the time they're in ninth or tenth grade or so, I want those scales at 144 or above, you know? And uh, I have had some students that I, if I thought they could do it, you know, that I've insist, insisted that they play their scales at 155 
or above, 160, thereabouts. That's pretty darn fast. That's faster than I could sit down and play it without practicing it. Um, but but all of that all that is very valuable because it becomes second nature, you know. And and it's easy with the dynamic changes. And I also do from PP to FF and back to PP and the reverse, which isn't easy. That one above all the others is something that you can plug into music. And that's what I tell them. All these things that you're doing, you are, you are able to take your scales and your arpeggios and when you see them in the music, you just do them. You don't have to sit there and decipher it and practice and practice it because the only scale you know is C major. You know them all. You know, you are, you're a master of them. Does that help? Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody have anything else they'd like to ask? Um, I don't want to take everybody's time, but if I could. Um, so this would be more about our students. You're saying there's some that you you know probably aren't going to be music majors. Um, I just had an instance where I had a student, a piece he really, really wanted to play, and it had a quarter note triplet over eighth notes in the left hand. Um, and especially online teaching, I just, I, I just really didn't think it was going to happen. And so I modified it to just be a quarter plus two eighths in the right hand instead of trying ah. to four against three with, it, it was just, I it, didn't want to stop him from playing the whole piece. It was four against three or three against two? Uh, four against three, a quarter note triplet. In that, the right. That's hard. Yeah. So I guess that my question generally is um, kind of, where do you think it's appropriate to make that sort of call? I mean, I guess I already made it, so I hope I should. <laughs> um, and, and when do you think you're doing the student a disservice? Both students who you think are, are, are excelling and, and students who, not that nobody's excelling, but. Um, you know, uh, I know lots of teachers who do those sorts of things because they feel that there's more advantage in the student being able to play the piece with this one little modification than in in withdrawing it from the student because they can't do that one little thing. Um, I, I don't modify very, very often, pretty, pretty seldom. I, I rather would try to find some gimmick that would help them to play it, you know, like my mother baked the cake, my mother baked the cake. Didn't work. Didn't work. Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, um, sometimes I can't hear you anymore. Somebody took you off. Um, so, um, sometimes uh, another, another thing that I would do if the student is not too young, if they're in junior high at least, is, is have them play one voice with the metronome perfectly correctly and then have them play the other voice with the metronome and then have them try to put them together for one measure. Um, it sometimes helps to tell them which note in the other hand, the, one, the faulty hand comes closest to, you know? Is it right before or right after some note? You know, rather than just, just kind of, just kind of putting it in there a little bit mathematically, that's not the way that, that great performers do it, but we got to start somewhere, you know? Um, it's, if, you've, if any of you have taught the, one of the WC arabesques, how many times have we heard? <laughs> and, and so, but that one's easier because three on two is really one, two, and three, one, two, and three. And or not difficult, not difficult, not difficult. Oh, not very difficult, not very difficult. Word, word games can help a lot. Anything else I can help with? <laughs> Okay, so I guess that concludes our first MTA lunch break series. Thank you guys for coming and let's thank Dr. Taylor for well, giving us wonderful questions. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure.
And um, do you mind? Do you mind if we email you some questions if some right come up? Go right ahead. Or if you have a question that 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 you have in mind right now, I'll hang around for a little bit. Thank you. Yes, you can email me. I might not answer the same day. It's a little crazy out there right now, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Oh, it's so good to see welcome. you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.